Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. Give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you. Wow. It's getting excited to hear my voice like this. This is our first live episode of Diffuse Congruence. I'm really excited. My name is Zachy Hessen. This is my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. And welcome to our listeners. A little more than that. Come on. Yeah, no, no, that's right. It's feeling bad. No, this is super exciting for us. Uh, we are really excited to be able to record in front of a live audience. We've never done it. Um, so hopefully this all turns out good. For those who are listening at home, welcome back to another You're episode. You're missing out. Yeah, You're listening right. at home. Right. Welcome back. But uh, we are, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, obviously, because we're doing this uh, as a live show. But also our very special guest, who we'll, I know we'll get to just momentarily. In just a second, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do want to take a couple minutes to give you the heads up on what this show is, because I get this question all the time. People come up, to, random people on the street. First, they're like, "Who are you?" Um, and then they say, "What is diffuse congruence? What does it mean? What's the meaning of the title?" And I say, "My partner came up with it. Don't blame me." That's usually what I say. But uh, I think it's helpful. Let's explain that. What does that mean? Sure. So on. Um, so in fact, so diffuse congruence is a, uh, in fact, a translation of a uh, term from within Muslim, uh, from within Muslim legal tradition specifically, which is uh, tawatur or mutawatur, which means, um, which is, which is essentially the uh, sort of the approach or by which uh, the Quran was co- was collected and was uh, was, was was compiled. And uh, also it relates to the way in which prophetic teachings, i.e. the hadith, get reported to us. But the idea of what, what, I, what fascinated me more so than the fact that it sort of stemmed from within Muslim tradition uh, was, uh, was this idea of diffuse congruence, the sort of literal meaning of, the, uh, of those two, two, two uh, uh, maybe on, on the surface despairing terms or terms that are disparate. Um, but the idea of this diffuse congruence being that Although the American Muslim experience, if you will, is one of diversity, i.e., you know, the composite of our community is diverse. We are a microcosm of the, of, of the world, uh, probably unlike any other ethnic minority here in America, certainly. Uh, we are really a microcosm of the world, ethnically, uh, cultural, cultural backgrounds, and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, while we see that diversity, i.e., the diffusion, if you will, there is some congru- congruity, that is congruence, the idea that we do share, at least in some ways, in spite of our differences, we do share a common tradition, we share certain com- common cultural backgrounds and cultural framings uh, and, and, and understandings and viewpoints to the world. So that's kind of a long-winded answer of uh, where kind of diffuse congruence comes from. But uh, to me, what's more like, to, what, what I'd, I'd like to also talk about is Sort of why the podcast and why we sort of came up with the idea. Why did we? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm wondering myself. <laughs> so Zucky, you know, is being a little humble here, but he, he's he's much more of a seasoned podcaster than I am. If that's it's concerned. a big problem. I need to get it looked at. <laughs> <laughs> so Zucky actually simultaneously does three separate podcasts, including this one. Um, so Zucky Zucky had been doing a podcast with a partner of his, actually two partners, uh, uh, more to do with film and movies and television and popular culture um, and just sort of talking about it, kind of like a film review and, and, and what's you know, going on, in, the going on in Hollywood kind of uh, talk um, for a little over, I think, what, how many years has it been now? Uh, four years. Four years. So good, you know, a good over a year before we started our show. And so, you know, I've been sort of listening as a, as a just a, as an as a avid listener of the, of the show and then I began kind of looking out there and seeing what's, what else is out there in the landscape in terms of podcasting and um, Muslims in the space. And I was super, sort of surprised uh, to find that, at least at that time, which is now going on three years ago, uh, there wasn't a whole lot out there, if any, if any. Now we're beginning to see other shows that are popping up, which is exciting. But at that time, certainly, there was a paucity, if not a complete sort of, there was just nothing there. So I thought, hey, why, why don't we start this podcast? And sort of bring the American Muslim narrative and experience to the podcast listeners out there. And, you know, I have to say the timing was, was I mean, fortuitous in, in, a, in a bad way, if that makes any sense, in that we, we sort of anticipated a lot of the stuff that's going on right now where, and you all know this because you're, you're living this, there's an entire conversation happening around Muslims, about Muslims, 
but not involving Muslims. And, you know, obviously we're, we're the, the hot topic of discussion in the Republican primary. They're competing to see how, who can hate us more. And, you know, something that Pervez and I are both really uh, ardent supporters of, this, of this, the, the idea that every community has stories. Every community has unique stories. And to, to, the, to the, the title, these are diffuse stories that bring a sense of congruence uh, and thus full circle that brings us to how the show started and, and you know uh, we've we've had um, some amazing conversations i mean right we've had like i mean uh, the uh, you kind of heard at the outset we've had poets we've had um artists of different varieties comedians academics scholars um you know traditional muslim scholars and academic scholars uh you name it so we really have tried to you know present again as a di- diverse and diffused Variety of, of, of guests as we as, as we've been able to do, and uh, kind of going in, going also to the to the sort of the reason the why right. Um, our intention or our intent sort of behind the show was not only to present those diverse viewpoints, but also to try and capture uh, personal narratives. Right, we've had some amazing guests who have some amazing stories. Uh, you know how they came to Islam or what uh, how they've navigated. Uh, their experiences, if they were even born Muslim, and so you know those personal narratives are rich, and again, they, they they make up and they comprise that American Muslim experience. So part of it was sort of an oral history, if you will, right, to capture these unique and very fascinating personal narratives, but also to, uh, in some cases, directly segue that into the work that that particular guest is involved with, um, and so we try to touch on. Issues that are germane and relevant to uh, you know the conversations that are happening, as Zaki mentioned, around us or about us, but we don't seem to uh, be able to really be an actor in that and just being a subject. So uh, I think, and it's funny that you mentioned, or interesting that you mentioned, um, we all have stories and the idea of presenting our story, because I think that brings us to our guest, because uh, I think we have a fascinating story and storyteller with us. So. We do. We do. <laughs> Perfect. It works out. All right. So our guest for today is Mark Gonzalez. Mark Gonzalez is an educator, strategist, and storyteller. He's collaborated on initiatives across the globe with an impact portfolio spanning five continents, 20 countries, and thousands of individuals. Each venture is centered on a shared purpose, igniting hearts, growth, and good. Please give our guest, Mark Gonzalez, a big round of applause. Thank you. Welcome, Mark. Uh, Thank you. We are super excited to have you. Um, so, why don't we kind of start from the beginning? Um, you know, I, I know in the uh, beginning. Yeah, that's right. So, take us back to your origin story. Uh, my origin story. Uh, well, it's interesting because for me, my origin story begins with before me, um, and I think that's one of the kind of conversations I've tried to start across the globe. Uh, is where you start the story uh, directly determines where it goes from there, mm. uh, and often. Uh, we're responding to other people's narratives. And so we're starting at maybe a specific time in history or we're starting at uh, our own birth. Uh, For me, you can't know my story unless you know my parents' story and you can't know their story unless you know their parents' story, Mm. Uh, which is then every story is a journey. Uh, My journey begins in my life in Alaska in 1975, uh, the child of a French-Canadian a uh, woman who's my mother, uh, Janice, who passed away in 1989, and my father, who's uh, born in Wyoming, uh, but the child of indigenous Mexicans from a small village in the southern part of Guanajuato uh, in central Mexico, who turns 80 this month in about two weeks. Uh, so I think for me, part of my story is growing up in Alaska being like, why am I here? Uh, And not in that philosophical sense of why am I here and what is the purpose of life, but no, like why are we in Alaska? Alaska? Like we're brown, we're supposed to be in warmer weather, this is not (laughs) fitting us well, and there's a bear outside our door. Um, Can we please leave? You know, so eventually I did leave, and I mean there's a whole story and journey we can get into of both what led up to that point and after, but leaving Alaska in... uh, 
1994, going to Colorado for several years, studying civil engineering, being frustrated uh, with a life behind a desk. I mean, like, this isn't what I want to do. Uh, and dropping out of school and then really studying and listening to communities and families and working a variety of jobs before realizing, wow, I really want to be engaged with how people learn. Mm. Uh, and going back to school in 99 and then doing undergraduate and then grad school in education and then working with different people in different countries up to the point now, you know, where it's like, oh, wow, starting a family and having a 20-month-old daughter and being like, whoa, you know, where I begin, someone else is beginning now. Yeah. Uh, and then just be playing a part in that circle and being like, oh, okay, so what is my role now? You know, and how do I share all the mistakes I made and be like, never do any of this in your life. Um, which is a horrible parenting strategy for those of you who have children or who uh, believe in taking that. Trying to protect your children from your mistakes, although uh, well-intentioned, is the worst way to, to raise children. Um, mm. It doesn't start from a space of love and imagination. It starts from a space of fear. Uh, which then you end up isolating them, which is very harmful to human beings. Um, so my point in my life now is actually uh, between here, Tunisia, um, sometime in the South Pacific, uh, in different initiatives that we're working on. Um, but I'll just pause it right there. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, so I, I guess tell us a little bit about sort of the, uh, like, like growing up, I mean, I know obviously sort of a culturally diverse family background, um, how, how how much of a role, if any, uh, does religion play in sort of in your you know in, the, in, the, in your early days? Okay, so it's funny yeah. because uh, uh, being born in a Roman Catholic family, which is Catholic on steroids, basically, <laughs> uh, it's kind of the easy way for how Roman Catholics are conceptualized in the world. Um, <laughs> But I think part of the thing is, I, I can answer in that way, which is normally like, oh, what is your religion, you know, and, and what tradition are you raised in? Um, but I'd actually like to start in a different way, which is being born in a town that's 40,000 people. And then you don't live in that town. You live in a village 80 miles south of that town, which is 400 people. And then you don't even live in that village. You live in the trailer park outside that town with 30 people. Mm. Uh, in a state twice the size of Texas, you know, and being there, um, religion, I think for me at a young age was something very different than a traditional form. It was just a kind of respect and reverence for how awe inspiring this planet is, mm. you know, when you're at 60 below zero and you're looking at snows and trees and you're looking at a glacier, you know, um, when you're in the summer and the sun doesn't set, you know, for, for several days, if not several weeks, you know, when you see a moose go by. And I remember we hit a moose when I was uh, 25, when I was like uh, driving home from the airport after visiting my dad. And it's like a moose runs out and hits the truck. And then uh, I told a friend later and she was like, oh, is the moose okay? I was like, the moose is fine. <laughs> like literally it demolished the truck and like the pillar that is right near um, the passenger door barely held on. Otherwise my father would have been killed. And it's like the moose literally got up and walked off. And moose are about like six to They're seven massive. feet tall. Yeah. And like, you know, this one didn't have antlers, you know, luckily. luckily. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, he wouldn't be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, growing up in that environment, it gives you a, a, a grounding, mm. you know, where you're like, okay, there's things bigger than me. Mm. Literally, you know? in, that, yeah. in that specific instance. Yeah. You know, and literally, and then as you grow older, that leads into the metaphysical questions right. that you have about life. It's like, are there things greater than me and greater than humanity and greater than this planet? Mm. Um, and I think at a young age, I kind of understood that. Okay. You know, and so for me, then the question became as life kept on going on is how do I understand that truth better? That's right. You know, and so for me, when my mother died when I was 14, my mother battled with clinical depression her whole life. Uh, Alaska has one of the highest depression and suicide rates uh, in the U.S., actually number one. And she's one of those statistics, took mm -hmm. her own life uh, in October of 89. Uh, in that, I think about then as a young child. Again, you're like, well, why am I here? 
you know, my mom's not here anymore and it's dark out all the time. What is my purpose on this planet? Especially when you're watching your dad try to deal with the woman he's loved for 25 years not be there anymore. And so that question of like, okay, what is truth? You know, and how do I heal from this pain? Um, one just led me to isolation for many years. Like I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to deal with anyone. Um, and then after four or five years, you're like, okay, that didn't work. Maybe I need to try something different. So then, yeah, what, what normally actually a lot of us get into is after isolation is self-destruction, which is like, okay, I don't like this life, so how can I just harm myself as much as possible in an enjoyable way? Um, you know, and so you live that lifestyle for several years and you're like, okay, that didn't work either. And then you're like, okay, maybe I should talk to someone. And then you're like, yeah, but I don't believe in therapists because I'm fine. You know, uh, there ain't nothing wrong with me. So you're like, okay, let me talk to some people. And then, you know, for me, the conversation with people was like, okay, you know, tell me about your life. Mm -hmm. What have you seen? What have you survived? You know, and what are your best practices, if you will, you know, for healing? Uh, and that conversation then started leading me to communities across the globe of what are you experiencing? What are your dreams? And what is your pain? And how are you healing from that pain in order to grow towards your dreams? And that took me to, you know, over 15 countries over 15 years, just sitting with people trying to understand that. And so when you ask me, going back to the original question, you know, uh, my journey with religion, for me that was and still is a core part of my religion. Right. You know, which is why am I here? Right. You know, and how do I understand everything that... And even though I can't understand it, how can I just try to better try to engage right. this life and be like, okay, why did this happen? You know? Right. And if Allah is the best of planners, how do I know that not just as a buzz phrase, but as a worldview? Like a lived reality, yeah. You know, like, okay, so there's a plan here. Mm -hmm. You know, I just don't know it yet. And how do I just keep on trucking along till I can get a better glimpse of what that plan is? Mm -hmm. So what did you find in terms of that? When you took that journey to see how people cope with loss and 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 depression and isolation uh, in your travels, uh, I mean, obviously that's a huge question. But I mean, you know, is there maybe some archetypes that you come across, like the way people deal with these things? Yeah, I mean, there there's classical archetypes you can draw from psychology, and depending upon which psychological uh, framework you're utilizing. But I think a better way of approaching it for me is really understanding that people deal with pain by how they name the source of the pain. Wow. Wow. And so... Often, for me personally, what we call pain, we think of as a problem, which it is. But because we define it as problem, we never see it as a symptom of a larger problem. We see it as the problem itself. Right. Got it. And so, for example, the pain of my mother, which I'm like, oh, my mom committed suicide, and so that's the problem. And I'm like, no, actually, this, that's a symptom. The problem was we have a poor system for mental health in this country that doesn't provide an inclusive way of people really looking at their pain and embracing them that could have prevented that problem from metastasizing into a worse problem leading to the symptom of suicide. You know? So for me, I'd say that's the core truth I've taken from listening with people across the globe. The other thing is that before you can, because we're talking about stories, um, we have a lot of people doing storytelling, and I, I really believe we're actually at a time where we should be doing story listening mm. as, as persons and as civilizations, you know, which is just like, okay, how do we really listen to one another and listen not just through the mechanical process of hearing phonemes and sounds, but really being like, what is being tried to communicate with me right now? You know, what is this person really trying to share, even if it comes out wrong, if it comes out rude, if it comes out, you know, not poetic, it doesn't come out perfect, just what is trying to be communicated? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. So, I mean, this is, like, I always hate asking this question just because I, I know that. Anyway, but I'm going to do it anyway. anyway. It's almost so like, get ready. Uh, this might sound racist, but no, you know, <laughs> it's one of those tropes. Um, don't finish. Yeah, yeah don't finish. Uh, 
No, and, and that is, and, and, I, and I, I can imagine if you're if you're a Muslim listening to the show, you know, you're, you're probably thinking also the same along the same lines, which is, well, what what took you to Islam? What's what, you know, what was your journey to Islam like? You know, and and, and that's normally when I walk off stage. Yeah, I got I'm like, yeah, there you know. go. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> um, no, honestly, really, because uh, I, I joke a lot because the truth comes out in anger and humor and sometimes delivering straight up truth to people, they, they don't appreciate it, so you have to conceal it in humor. Uh, and for me, part of the reason uh, I joke about it is that people are like, oh, what's the conversion story? Is often because they're like, yay, we got a Mexican. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, so you've nailed or you've touched on one of the reasons why I hate asking that question. The other being that conversion is seen as an event. Uh, as opposed to a process, yeah, an ongoing process. So, in a, uh, an interview I had done with uh, Orange County Weekly about a series we were doing with youth in uh, Southern California, they asked me that question. They're like, "How?" And I, I appreciate because I knew the writer. He was like, "How would you describe?" Mm. You know, and he's like, "Do you?" I, I say, I, "I don't say I converted. I say, in 2003, I began practicing Islam." Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Because I don't know what conversion means. Like, I, I really don't. I still don't know if I'm doing this thing right. Probably. You know, I'm just trying to walk on my journey of my religion, which is what is truth? And how do I understand truth better? And how do I embrace truth? And how do I humble myself to truth? And how do I love truth? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So that, I think that is <laughs> good enough. Uh, Zucky, I was, I was turning over to Zucky, yeah. <laughs> where Zucky needs to go. Yeah. So, how did you convert? No, I- <laughs> No, but I mean, just in terms of, uh, you know, just in your bio, right, you, there's this, uh, the, the notion of being a storyteller. I mean, I think that's in, in and of itself is fascinating. And, and I, want, I was wondering if you could juxtapose that notion of telling stories versus listening to stories and how that translates to greater efficacy in terms of engagement with the broader community. Yeah, uh, Danish Masood, beautiful brother and soul, uh, political advisor at the United Nations. He does uh, work with this phenomenal technology called Be Another Lab. Uh, I appreciate how he discusses storytelling as a part of human empathy technologies. Hmm. And I think that's just kind of a core way of addressing and, and framing, like, what is this thing called story? You know, it's really part of human technologies, like for me, which is one of the conversations a lot of us are having, which is in a digital era. Like, what are the technologies that have always existed, you know, since the beginning of time? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, well, we're, I mean, we're 150,000 years old as a species, and our current ideation is, is Homo sapiens, yet we can't get past pre-iPhone, which was 10 years ago. <laughs> well, we're not backwards compatible. That's the problem. As, as human beings, are, are, have, have, we have a hard time moving, moving go, th- visualizing. You know, I, I tell this to my students all the time, uh, especially kids these days, which I never thought I'd say that phrase, but there we go, kids these days. Um, I'm always like, imagine going... Welcome to the club. <laughs> I, know, really, right? um, I say, imagine going back to the very first cell phone that you had. And, I mean, these, you know, m- most of my students are, like, college freshmen, so we're talking phones within the past five to seven years. So this is still pretty fancy-schmancy, you know yeah. what I mean? And they just, you can see them break out in hives. I mean, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm starting a catastrophic moment there. So I'd actually say we are backwards compatible. Uh, however, it's our understanding both of, it's, and to get a little bit technical, sorry for the audience, but the concept of linear progression is what frames this idea of backwards lesson planning. It's like, okay, you're either moving forward or you're moving backwards versus all things are happening simultaneously. Sure. So as we're moving forward, we're also still experiencing things that had happened before. And so yeah. um, the ideas of genetic memory, which is something I speak a lot about in it and I, I work a lot on, which are what are the mechanics of genetic memory? And people are like, okay, that sounds some like hokey pokey, you know, uh, uh, (laughs) neo-science, like new age X. (laughs) We'll we'll omit that for our listeners. Um, But so in that, it's like, no, actually, I always tell people just look at your hands, you know, and really look at your hands and be like, who's in your hands? You know, do you have your mother's hands or your father's hands? You know, and then I I tell them, like, look, we, we do exercises in collective environments, too. It's like using a mirror to map out, like, who have we inherited? 
and then utilizing that conversation then to map out behavior and map out behaviors in our family, what you call family constellations, and be like, okay, what are the behaviors in our grandparents and our aunts mm. and uncles? And being like, oh, wow, yeah. I do that. Right. You know, and it's you start to identify like where things come into your body, just both physically and then in terms of behavior wise as well. You know, because genetics not only, the, the human genome not only carries physical characteristics, but emotional characteristics. Right. And the neuroscience the department at Emory University at Atlanta, it's a common study I always share about, which is a study they're doing around how emotions are transmitted across generations. And how an experience of mass trauma that inflicts upon s certain animals is carried not only within that animal, but their children, their children's children, and their children's children. It's three generations before fear is extinguished from a parent experiencing something very traumatic. And so on one level, that's a new technology, right? Because this goes back to our backwards lesson planning. It's like, oh my gosh, the brain, it does this. And it's like, oh, we've never known this. And I'm like, actually, indigenous generations have been saying the idea of seven generations. Yeah. You know, when something happens to someone, we actually have to think about its effects seven generations forward. I'm like, so neuroscience is evolving to what has already existed behind us. Wow. You know, we pay $100 to $150 for a farm to fork dinner. You know, the idea of like this was locally fresh, organically grown, handmade in front of you. I was like, oh yeah, like we did for dinner. Yeah, <laughs> a couple like twenty years ago, you know, just wasn't a hundred and fifty dollars, <laughs> you know. So it's like we're moving forward to move back. So true. Wow, mm, that's right. Uh, so no, t t talk a little bit more about the the, the idea of uh, of, of that of that genetic memory and 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 just like as we say, like that's part of our DNA. Now, how much of that is just science, like me, or I should just say, bi sorry, biology. And how much of that is, you know, the whole nurture versus nature kind of uh, thesis? So I think the linear progression and binary frameworks get to the, uh, both of those questions, which is, there is no either or. Okay, right. It's both at the same time, you know. It's understanding the things that influence us, mm -hmm. and then understanding that there's agency always on the table. And then as Muslims or any person with a sacred tradition, also understanding that there are things beyond our control. Uh, as uh, Dr. Umar Farouk said, uh, you know, we are people who believe in the miraculous. That's right. Past guest of the show. You know, Sorry, I got to drop that. Yeah. <laughs> friend, friend of the show. Friend of the show. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, science. Yeah, I appreciate it. He said science, yeah. you know, is taking logical conclusions, you know, upon perceived realities. But Allah is not bound by science. So mm. part of being a Muslim is believing in the miraculous. Right. Now, right. You, you mentioned the, the, the uh, you said human empathy technologies. technologies. Well, and, and I think that's a key term there, empathy, because I feel like that's something that's sorely lacking in a lot of our discourse today. Uh, so I, I would, I'm, I'm interested in, in the foregrounding of that and why you do place such importance on that term. Um, I think part of that has to do with a, a dialogue I, I had done with Justin Mashouf in, in L.A., beautiful brother, you yeah. all should look him up if people don't know him, For sure. um, which was the fundamental issue facing human beings at this time, I believe, is that we only know how to feel two emotions, rage and numbness. Mm. <laughs> wow. And due to that, and actually even beyond that, saying that, well, why is that an issue when, you know, countries are being occupied, when, you know, there's human trafficking, when we have poisoning of water in Flint? It's like, how can I say this emotional reality is like the problem, you know, of the planet? And I'm like, it's not the problem per se. It's that there's actually no lack of brilliant solutions to every problem we're facing as a species. We have the answer to every problem in front of us. But we're either numb right. or we're too angry to do anything about it. And so because of that, we just have these really brilliant solutions that just sit in empty auditoriums that nobody wants to listen well, to. I mean, how did we get there? I mean, that, that can get into a whole bunch of different conversations, which is how did we end up to this point as humans? You know, really, like, I mean, part of it is like some of us are like, I just came out the womb. Like, like I didn't do anything. Like, like... 
you know, and that's part of the genetic memory too, is like there's genetic inheritance and there's social and structural inheritances. You know, we're living on a trajectory as a species. You know, so we got to this point through a series of choices and decisions that were made both individually and structurally by persons and nations uh, and sometimes forced and imposed upon other people and nations. Right. Uh, and that's led, it to, led us to this specific moment in human history where it's like, oh, wow, we're really facing a really interesting tipping point, which is brilliance or extinction. That's a pretty stark choice. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really what we're facing it as species when you look at everything from climate change to uh, food streams and ecosystems to uh, wars and displacement, which ironically, actually, in terms of nations, we are at the most peaceful time in human history. Even though there's more refugees at any other point in human history, we're actually at the most nation peaceful time in human history. That's right. There's never been this type of calm on the planet. Yet, somehow, we're still managing to put ourselves near the brink of extinction. Right. That's comforting. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, I mean, because what, 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 you know, in, in the days of, of old, it was a perpetual state of warfare, uh, whether it was tribal or it was, you know... Every was, day yeah. is war. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So it's a very interesting point, one that, that is often forgotten. Um, but um, I, I guess take us to you know, I mean, you know, the the idea of uh, and, it, and, it, and it obviously it's related to our own genetic memories and so on. But something that's infused in that, um, or as we say, it's part of our DNA is this is this idea of storytelling and and the need to what preserve ourselves in our stories. Uh, what's the sort of what, what was the impetus, I guess, right, in your mind for why storytelling has been integral to the human experience? Uh, stories are the original form of knowledge transmission for our species. It is both the engine of identity, it's how we learn to do things. It is the preserver of culture and belief, you know, and it is also the space of innovation and dreams. It's also the space for many traditions through which revelation occurs, you know. So... It's key on every level, an emotional level, a cultural level, a social level, and a spiritual level. Like, it is what makes us who we are, you know? And so I, I remember you seeing uh, to talk with a, a, a bunch of youth in L.A., and, like, one of the favorite conversations would be um, giving them a, a variety of cities or countries on the planet, being like Palestine, Iraq, Mexico, and they'd have to list out Okay, what are all the things that exist there? You know, and they would list it out da -da 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 on their piece of paper, like in a kind of three columns. And then before we shared out anything, I'd be like, okay, how many of you have ever been to Palestine? Mm -hmm. No hands go up. Iraq, no hands go up. Mexico, depending where you're at in LA, a lot of hands can go up or no hands go up. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, okay, so you've never been to these places, but you have a picture already in your head. Why is that? How can you have a visual imagery of a place and a people you've never experienced? Mm -hmm. Oh, I heard stories about it. You know, well, mm -hmm. and then this is, well, who's telling the stories? Where do you hear it? Oh, on the news, or I heard it on this, or it was in the textbook. And this is for me both the power of the story, also understanding the importance of who's telling the story come into play. Because mm -hmm. most of them had very different images of those places than I had had when I actually experienced and visited those places, you know? And so it's like, oh, okay, so how is it that if we see, or if you believe one thing, then why is it that the world actually looks very different than that thing, you know? And so for me, this is also part of story. It's like, okay, it's, there's what we call the geography of the imagination, you know? What is the way in which, you know, the terrain of the earth is shaped by what we imagine it to be? You know, even before we encounter it. And for me, stories are, are a key sculptor in that geography. You know, it's like you can tell a story and you can have someone like having nightmares or dreams before they go to sleep. Right. You know, you can tell a story, you can have someone in tears or someone in love. You know, you can tell the story and you can create a time machine that takes your father or your mother back to a time they were 13 or 12 years old. 
you know, in, in, in a second. You can play a story, a, a song, because, you know, stories we have to get beyond are just like, I was going to say right. Articulate It's right. like music is stories Cinema is stories sure. You know Visual narratives are stories It's like these are all forms of stories You show someone something And it's like all of a sudden They're in another time in life And it's like oh wow It's like this is real You know right. And so for me it's like This is such a powerful tool and technology that, You know That It's amazing to me that we're I shouldn't say we Because I'd say it's amazing to me That some societies are barely grasping the power innate within this. Sure. You know, other societies, you know, whether you look at indigenous communities within the Americas or oral traditions, you know, and especially, especially when we think of Islam, mm -hmm. like in terms of Hadith or et cetera, it's like, well, the story is a key part of the relationship fabric. You know, it's what weaves a connection between people or between people and the divine. That's right. You know, so it's like, oh, this is a, a core part of nearly every part of the planet. Um, maybe we should value it a little bit more. Right. It'd be nice. Right. And so, like you said, I mean, like w the the means may vary. So it, you know, maybe what, what maybe started off as sort of an, an oral exercise becomes a written one, and then, you know, then you have, like you said, music and arts and cinema. Um, so, because I mean, oftentimes when we think of storytelling, we think of it in the most sort of primitive form. Or I don't want to say pri primitive is a problematic word, but in its more sort of original, original form, which is just verbal. But there's other ways to tell a story as well that's beyond just oral yeah, we, we could use the phrase in its core form. Okay, there you go. You know, at the yeah. core, uh -huh. what is the story? You know, it's the curation of language uh, and language being small l, meaning the way yeah. in which communication occurs. Right. Between person and the universe. Hmm. And I say the universe, lowercase universe, because it can be actually anything. So a person can offer a prayer. You know, that's not to another person, that's to their creator. And so it's like, oh, but that's a story. A person can, you know, share a story to an animal, to an inanimate object. It's like a story, though, is the curation of an idea, you know, an information through language mm -hmm. and offering it up. You know, and for what purpose, then it's dependent upon what the storyteller wants it to be. And as well as what the audience experiences, because you all aren't passive in this. And this is, to me, one of the key parts that's missing out of our current concept of storytelling, okay. is that the audience is seen as passive recipients of the story. When it's like, nah... Like, like you, you go into, especially communities that are familiar with like call and response... Sure. Or of the Apollo Theater, like would be a more modern version of it, where it's like if your story's not engaging, like you're being removed as a storyteller. It's like no, 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 you've had <laughs> enough. Like, like get off stage, son. Like it's over. Uh, and so there's always a relationship between the person sharing the story and the person receiving the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a transactional process. It's, I mean, there's there's a give and take. Yes, although. Um, It'd be interesting because transactional is given, taken, and often referred to in terms of benefit versus what is the term for just, it's a shared experience, hmm. you know. The, someone may not be giving, someone may not be taking, maybe it just is, you know, sure. or maybe so both people are giving a, a experience. moment to, to experience something together. You know, when a parent, when my father is telling me, you know, a story about his childhood, and I'm listening. Who's giving and who's taking it? That True. Well, I mean, I, th I think I think there is there is because you're gaining wisdom, and he's gaining the pleasure of sharing that right. wisdom with you, right? So there is. I mean, so in that sense, so we're both giving and we're both benefiting at, at the same time. Yeah, right. So you're both sender and receiver. Absolutely. Yeah, I got. Which is at the core of any transaction. I mean, going back to your transaction sort of analogy, right? I mean, both. Like, if don't don't ruin this for me. <laughs> If we look at it in terms of like... It's like, even, I'm going to reverse Lauren Hill. You might lose some, but I just won one. <laughs> <laughs> nicely done. Nicely done. Uh, okay, I forget it. Forget my point. Uh, I, but going back to... I, I, I wanna, I, I'd like to pick up on a, a, like what, what we were saying at the, at the beginning of sort of like, okay, when we started the show and, 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 and being almost fortuitous in terms of what was unbeknownst to us, you know, what's going to the present political climate and so on. Sure, right. Yeah. Um, we live in a time where, you know, 
we aren't just sort of a fifth column, but you know, our very existence in this country is questioned in terms of like, okay, should we even belong here? So in that in that context, where does story? What role does storytelling? So I, I have a story called yes. The Alchemy of Storytelling. Yes. And then it opens up with, you know, we live between crosses and crescent moons. Please talk about that. And so <laughs> yeah. when, when you ask, like, well, why should we be here? Uh, I always remind people, like, like it's being a, a, from a family indigenous to central Mexico, I've always been here. Like, we've been on this continent before Mexico, the U.S., or Canada was here. Because someone in Canada wrote me the other day after I was making a... a we are having a dialogue, and they're like, why do you stay there? Come to Canada. And I was like, because I've always been here. Yeah. How can I not be here? Hmm. You know, this is where my, my mom's buried. You know, this is where my grandparents are buried, where their great-grandparents are buried, and so forth and so forth. It's like, how could I not be here? And I, I think this is part of the question for stolen Africans, you know, <laughs> what we would call the black community or some the African-American community. It's like, well, where should we be? You know, and that's their question. It's like, right. what do you mean? Like, we predate this here to the 25 to 35% of Muslims that were part of the transatlantic slave trade, you know? It's like, well, where are they to go? It's like, this is ours, you know? Mm -hmm. And especially if you get into some really economic conversations in terms of like, well, if labor was denied its pay, it's still due. So then actually we have a better right to this than anyone else because we built it. You've got a debt to pay, right? Yeah. Right. So it's like, well, I'm not going anywhere, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And I think there's something else that comes really with a really interesting conversation with that I'm not going anywhere. It's like, well, then I also have a responsibility to grow here. Right. Because this is home. And but you always want home to be beautiful. And I think part of this, so just on one last thought is, no, no, please. is with, you know, my little one, and I think of her at 20 months, and people are like, oh, so is Tunisia home now for you all? You know, especially as we, we, we launched the new Medina in uh, Sousse, uh, in North Africa. And I'm like, yes, it is home. And this is home. And... Washington, Seattle, where my you know, father's turning 80 is home, and where my mother's buried, and the central Washington is home, and in uh, Queretaro, in the southern part of uh, Guanajuato, and that's home, in the South Pacific, you know, where we have some really good uh, friends who are like family to us, uh, in terms of Canic people, the uh, New Caledonia. Um, that's home, because home is where your loved ones are. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, we're really trying to engage the question of how can we understand that home is not singular. Huh. That that's what's being presented to us with the choose question, is you only get one. And it's like, no, 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 I reject that framework. Home is many places. And, I, and I'm going to love and embrace them all. And I will also, you know, transform and push back anything that tries to tell me that's not home, that's not my home, and that I can't love you. So, so and, and what you just said kind of prompted this question as well, but it goes back to the question I wanted to ask when, you know, uh, just a few minutes ago, which, and, and Zaki, this goes back to a conversation we had with Asif Manvi, right? Sure. Uh, right when he, he had just released his book, No Lands Man. Right. Did we get that right? Yeah. No Lands Man. No Lands Man, which this feeling of, like, again, <laughs> being born of, well, in his case, being an immigrant himself, but I related to it as a children of immigrant, which, uh, of, of immigrants to this country, which is, like a feeling of, or, or la you know, feeling that lack of belonging, whether it is in the homeland or it's here for other for, for different reasons. Well, I, I think just to just to piggyback on that, I mean, there is there is a tendency uh, of people to you know, if if you are uh, off white or non white, to people say, "Where are you from?" And you know, I've I've gotten this. Where are you from? Uh, Chicago. No. Where are you from? Chicago. Really? Like they get, they do that, you know? And, and, and I still remember move, when I first moved back to the States, having lived in Saudi Arabia for about 10 years. I was, I was born in Chicago, lived in Saudi Arabia, and um, I had gone to an American school the entire time. I considered myself American, and I remember the kind of acclimating back, and this is in junior high, right? And I remember after a couple of days, this one kid was like, you know, if you want to fit in, you got to lose that accent. And I've never talked anyway, but this. 
So I'm like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing right now because this, this just makes no sense. You know, so this, that sense of like you're always on wrong footing. Yeah. Right. So, you know, when when wage beauty, like the phrase first came out like years ago, when uh, it was 2009, 2010, when I was getting ready to do a, a, a series between here, um, and we did one with that refugee camp in Amman and then uh, some in the Gulf, um, it came from this concept of like, what do human beings need? You know, on a core level and an emotional level. And I kept on coming back to these three things, love, beauty, and belonging. A human being needs to feel loved, they need to feel beautiful, and they need to feel a sense of belonging. If any one of these three ingredients drop out, horrible things normally follow, whether they're things a person does to themselves or to other people. Wow. Sure. Like these are the, the kind of three ingredients. Um, and so when I hear you saying that, it just reminds me of just like, okay, that's the, the issue of belonging. Where do I belong? Yeah. You know, and that's, I think that's a, one, a, a philosophical question, but there's real racial, gender, spiritual, sexual implications to that question. To a person who said, I've lived my life just trying to be a good person. And I've done everything they said, but somehow I'm still told no. Mm -hmm. What do I do? You know? And you find some really brilliant answers come out of that question. You feel some really ugly answers come out of that question. Um, and I think part of that, though, really comes back to the idea of what you're saying in, in just of... For me, this goes back to similar the pain question of how I name the source of the pain directly uh, shapes how I try to respond to it. Right. Is that in this sense, for me, the issue isn't how we're answering the question. It's the issue is why are we responding to the question? Oh, nice. Makes sense. Why do I even have to justify my existence to someone else? That's true. What makes someone else feel they have the right to determine whether or not I can inhale oxygen in this specific <laughs> piece of the planet at the moment? Right. Like, how arrogant is that? Like, I'm like, I'm good. Like, like you know, like, I, I don't have to answer your question. And because I'm spending so much time answering your questions, I never actually get to ask my own. You're right. And so my entire existence is based in response to other people's inquiries. And that is not living. Hmm. It's That's, reacting. Exactly. It's reacting. Which goes back to the, like, what I was saying earlier, which is, or asking earlier about just our collective experience as a Muslim community in America right now is just reacting and responding. So, so I, I, I want to offer up a framework both for the audience in person and, and online, is which is there is no Muslim identity. Yes, let's start And, and I, I really want to frame that because it's one of the things that people are like, is Muslims is this, is Muslims is this. I'm like, there is no Muslim. And I think what would help theoretically is if we begin to imagine Muslim as the point of unity through which many identities intersect and try to understand Islam capital I. It allows us to move beyond this space of Muslim and really get into just like, who am I? And what do I bring to this collective conversation that we're all trying to have? Because so much of, I find, our, our, our time and energy is spent in the Muslim identity question that I'm like, that's not the question. And, and we actually would have far more benefits if we engaged in some other dialogues. Nice. Talk about, well, capital, because I, I, I use that expression a lot, Islam with a, Islam capital I. Then what's the lowercase? I, like, how, how do you s d differentiate and separate those? So uh, I think an easy way to think about yeah. it is, is this is capital L language is communication, not loser. Everyone's like, <laughs> how rude. <laughs> I thought we were cool. <laughs> right. So capital L is yeah. language. Which means a process of communications, you know, whether it's through humans, whether it's through animals, whether it's through angels, whether it's through divine, whether it's through jinn, whatever we want to put out there. Like, it's just communication. Okay. Um, small L language is Arabic, Spanish, French, German, sign language, etc. And we confuse the two. When we talk about language, and I'm like, no, I'm interested in the capital L language. How does communication happen? So Islam, for me, is the same thing. Capital 
I, Islam, is with Allah. It is the process through which when we say everything has a perfect order. Right. But every, we also know we can't understand that. Right. Or everything is in that, in that definition then Muslim because it submits to that order. Right. right. Okay. You know, right. So then small Islam mm -hmm. is whatever we understand the capital to be, which is part of our journey here on this planet, which is what is that? And I find often that's actually how we end up in the dogma conversations, is that we think we have the right to define the capital I. And I was like, there's no understanding the capital I from my belief in, in this journey, because that would mean you understand a law. Right. Right. That's what always keeps us humble. Right. It's like, no, we do the best we can. And at the end of the day, we say, Allah, yeah. You know, it's like, I don't know. God knows best, right? Yeah, and, and it's interesting, because I, I use it the same way in terms of framing it that way, between the capital and the, and the lowercase. And, and also that point, you know, again, one of the things Muslims, or you often hear Muslims say is, well, well, like, like well, all, all, all the prophets were, were, you know, taught Islam. Well, hold on there, because there's, again, lowercase i and there's capital i yeah. you know and so there's the there's the universal the historical and then the what i like to maybe sometimes even frame as the muhammadan reality which is unique to a certain set of dogma and certain practices and so on that are unique to that islam but then there's the broader sort of islam if we want to get into like all the prophets teaching that capital i yeah or you could say there's a beta version <laughs> right. and then there's like okay there's this version at this point in life you know, right. and then, you know, when we, if we get into, you know, every, you know, every prophet came in the language of the people, you know, for the needs of that specific moment. Then if we know that no moment is a replication of any moment before it, then we have to say every revelation has a different purpose right. to a specific people at a specific moment in time. Right. So go back then, I mean, because we, we kind of went on a slight detour, because you were talking about... Again, storytelling and, uh, you know, how we, like, you started off by saying there's no Muslim, I, you know, identity, right? Yeah. Was, yeah. And so maybe continue I, that. Yeah. So yeah. for me, that's just, it, it, that's again, it's singular. Point. Home is right. not singular. Muslim is not singular. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's how we, we really get into pluralism, you know, in a really interesting way. Uh, Subcommandante Marcos, uh, who was kind of the voice of uh, the Zapatista uprising in uh, southern Mexico and Chiapas um, launched indigenous people uh, freedom movement on January 1st, 1994, uh, actually took back the indigenous land, primarily almost all women generals. Uh, through that movement, they, to this day, have remained a sovereign area in the southern part of Mexico, which is really resource rich, what was very economically poor. And they're like, why is there so many resources there and, and we're dying of hunger and other things? So in that, one of the, he, he's shared so many different frameworks that people really fell in love with a lot of the ideas he was sharing. Um, he wrote a book called Our Word is Our Weapon. You know, and the second book was uh, The Speed of Dreams. Uh, and in one of them, for me, he put forth a frame that really resonated with me. When they're like, what is your goal? You know, what's your purpose? And he said, we are building a world in which all worlds can fit. And that's what I think of when I think of like similar with like Muslim is not singular. Which is like, okay, there are many worlds within even lower case Islam. You know, so there's room enough for all of us. So what does that framework look like? And if we engage that, I think we'll actually have a lot more mutual benefit, as well as addressing the structural realities and bigotry that are ending lives across this planet in very real ways, in very real time, that the needle on those issues will finally move instead of just the internal fighting, which we see so much of going on now. Uh, real quick, I just want to let everyone in the audience know, if you have questions, uh, sort of be thinking about them, because we're going to throw to you in, in a couple minutes. So kind of be, be, be thinking on those, and there, there's a mic in the middle, so if, in, in like five minutes. Yeah. Um, you alluded to it, you, you, you mentioned the New Benita initiative that you're involved with in Tunisia. 
Uh, maybe talk a little bit about that because I know that's something that you have spent a lot of recent months, if not longer, being involved with. So, so and, oh, and, and, and how does Star Wars relate to that? Yeah. <laughs> so Tunisia. <laughs> Tunisia, um, North Africa, Al Maghreb, Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, Libya, uh, beautiful region. Most people, you know, it's funny when we talk about the romantic history of, of Islam and people talk about the golden age, you know, they talk about Al Andalusia. Uh, but the reality is Al Andalusia is just like a central government which is being found by Al Maghreb. Like, so the actual cultural origins. You know, both in terms of scientific civilizations, languages, etc., is coming from North Africa, right. which is why when people go into North Africa, they're like, "Oh my God, look at the Spanish tiles and etc." I'm like, "Yeah, they're not Spanish; <laughs> so they predate Spain." You know, right. and, and then you actually have to get into conversations, you know, pre-Islam and the like Berber people, you know, and the Amazigh and like all the different languages, languages. and the Phoenicians right. and <laughs> Romans and Greeks, and then. Also really interesting then saying, well, if the Romans are part of North Africa, how do we understand Romans not just as, quote, an occupying force, but also Romans are Tunisian? You know, it's like, why do the Romans get credit for things that are built in Tunisia if Tunisians are built in front by it? You know, and so there's all these different conversations. You're like, wow, this is a lot of rich history, a lot of rich language, a lot of rich ideas, which is also why you go to the country even today, there's a 97% youth literacy rate. Higher education, you know, since Ben Ali has left, uh, enrollment has doubled, you know, within the last three years. Um, you have nearly, actually I'd say 100% of the country is bilingual and over 50% of the country is trilingual. The American University of Tunis is opening up a $100 million campus, the second AU continent, as AU University on the continent of Africa in 2020. And it's where Star Wars was filmed, you know, in the 1970s, actually from one, two, three, and four. Um, in Tozer Nefta, uh, uh, on the Algerian border, uh, the, the, the Tatooine, you know, when you That's go there, it's like still out there. Uh, it's actually Sarat, you know, uh, we have a, a video of Sarai and Sarat on the camel. Uh, Your wife and daughter. Yeah, yeah. With the uh, uh, Star Wars set right there. Like they're just kicking it. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, what are you doing? Just riding a camel on Star Wars. You know, that's it. The, uh, the, the Luke Skywalker yes. house. Yeah, the, the, you know, the little the you know, homestead at They built the set and they left it there. You know, which some people find fascinating. Other people are like, that's actually really a jerk move. Like you built <laughs> a film set and then well, just left it yeah, there. You know, like, well, what's, something else what's, to blame George Lucas for. What, yeah. What's interesting about that, though, is that there was an effort made to preserve that and restore it and make it, and it's become a, a tourist destination, right? And to me, what that this dovetails with what you were talking about, about the power of stories, where here we have this, you know, this fictional universe that it has just as much pull for people to the point that they're willing to make this, this trek and, and go check out the sites, this, this, this fictional place that's essentially become a right. historic site. So this, so yes, absolutely. So, which dovetails into the New Medina because the conversation is when you have all this beauty, and you have the first, second, and third oldest mosque in Africa, all in Tunisia, Kirwan, Susa, and, and Tunis. When you have the name through which Africa gets itself, Sus is originally called Ifriqia, you know, from the Phoenicians, which when the Romans came, that's how they named the rest of the continent. When you have the second largest you know, producer and exporter of olives and olive oils in the entire world coming from this country, but you have a 70% decline in tourism, a sector which is responsible for 20% of the entire nation's GDP, you then have a 40% youth unemployment rate. So you have hella educated, right. highly, educated, high literacy, highly frustrated, highly frustrated. Mm. a recipe, oh, no, not so good. Yeah. Yeah. Which is then you end up with between Tunisia and Libya, one hundred and seventy thousand boats leaving every year for the Italy as refugees, and you have the number one source of recruits for youth from ISIS and the planet over three thousand. Wow. Yikes. So between these two, you're like, okay, well, why? And you get on the round, and you're like, oh, yeah, people are just, like, they're like, I need to eat. So what do I do? Because I can't just stay. And part of it then is like, actually, what would make you stay? Because the question isn't, so how can we get you 
better to Europe or how can we like get you like safer across? It's like, how do you stabilize vulnerable and destabilized regions? That's right. And part of that makes me think of like Saraya's uh, statement around tourism, which is like really about most tourism models is about like how do we get the individual here to get as much money from them as possible yeah. instead of really like oh how do we just have a lot of fun at home right. that makes more people want to come visit mm -hmm. you know and so the new medina is part of that initiative it's actually opening up an 8,000 square foot center that's both the contemporary art gallery a co-working space a dar which is like a you could say a boutique um, hotel um, and a little dreamer's lab, you know, a place for the children in the Medina, the old city of Sousse. Uh, and using that as a space through which to create a spiral effect both for the Medina, because Medinas, we have to understand across the globe, are the cultural treasure chests of entire civilizations. But nowadays they're just looked down upon as that's where the poor people live. Right. Mm. Like How did we get to this point where our most beautiful and treasured places are the things that we reject and talk words about? You know, and so for us, we're like, okay, if we can play a role in reversing that and nurturing and growing an entire new generation as well as movement uh, by creating uh, site-specific places for people to connect with mentors locally as well as globally, then uh, I'm done. That. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to throw to the audience. If anybody has any questions. We're, we'd love to, so you can just uh, form a line over there if, if anybody has any answer to that, right? This is always the, I'm not going to be the first person you can. Oh, there we go. One brave soul. <laughs> it's like, I've got this. Hey, so my name's Okin. Yes. Uh, so I think one thing you're saying is really interesting is that you're talking about how you think a lot of the problems that humanity already solves, but people you can assume them, must be angry. Um, but I guess, when people you talk about that issue, a lot of people usually say that humanity's problems come from humans being self-interested, and then problems don't get solved when it's in their self-interest to solve them. So I guess my question for you is how do you view the so compliments that idea, or if you think they're different, and why you would say the numbness and anger is a better definition than self-interest? That's, that's an amazing question, and uh, to kind of add one part, which is where humans always or only think about themselves in their own interests, you know, is even if the way we think will benefit us actually even harms us, because this is part of the story too. So we're being told, this is the medicine for your problems, but you take the medicine and you only get sicker. You know, this is a, the, where we're at actually as a, a species, interestingly enough, because we often think in these conversations that, okay, if we just had more wealth, you know, we'd be fine. You know, but I've worked actually with wealthy communities in different sectors, uh, and actually I see no higher rate of addiction, no higher rate of molestation, and no higher rate of self-harm than within a lot of the wealthy communities. They're not locked up, you know, and uh, policed at the same rate is which poor in communities of color are. But I think one of the things is we don't realize like, oh, what we think will actually heal us in a lot of ways actually even harms us. So how do we open up a conversation of like, what is in our interest, you know? And is, it in our, is our interest just economic? Is our interest life expectancy and quality of life? Is our interest the future of our children? Is the interest the future of the species? Because how we define interest is going to drastically and dramatically shape how we pursue it. Uh, and so for me, that goes back to literally, again, kind of what you're uh, holding in, in your question, which is this idea of what we call uh, the zero-sum paradigm. And the zero-sum paradigm is a paradigm in economics which says there's only a fixed amount of resources so in order for me to go up, someone else has to go down. And we're actually saying, how do we create a win-win paradigm? Which is, my interests are your interests. And our interests can be tied together if we just dig deep enough and go hard enough at the question of like, there's a win-win for this for all. 
And maybe that win-win is like, oh, I do a little bit less with X. But because I'm not giving up, I'm investing X, even though it's going down, I'm gaining this on the back end. And that's my win. I don't know if that, if that helps answer the question. Yeah, I'm just interested in the like, way you've got self-interest tied into what you presented. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think often that's on the conversation. It's like... But, you know, I, I re as you say that, I remember a question back like in philosophy class, like a long, long time ago, which was the premise, as you said that, I, it just clicked. I remember the premise of the professor, very first day, was humans only act in their self-interest. Mm -hmm. That was the very first premise. And I remember sitting there and I was like, actually, that's not true. Mothers will sacrifice their lives for their children. Fathers do things amazingly. Like you see animals actually sometimes like throw themselves in front in order to save their offspring. And some will say, okay, is that self-interest or collective interest? I'm like, those aren't the same. You know, so actually people will sacrifice even when there's no benefit for them in certain moments. So is it a default paradigm that can be then overrun at other times? Mm. Or is maybe there's multiple paradigms at, at, at play? You look like you have follow-up. Yes. Uh, sorry, so I've heard that example, like a decent amount of times when it talks yeah. about self-interest, but one thing some people would say is that when it comes to parenting, it's almost a self-interest as a parent to take care of the offspring you made so that they can hmm. pass on the culture or whatever you teach them. So like, is an example of like a mom or Parent dying to a child, for example, of not self-interest, or is that just? Sort of hmm. Well, it gets it. I mean, it gets into a really interesting philosophical conversation, which even gets into okay, I donated something. I didn't get anything out of it, but it made me feel good. So it's actually a selfish motive because I wanted that feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, on one level, you can reduce everything to that element, but I think it strips something out of the sacred, and it strips something out of the giving that is present, not just in human beings, but on the planet. And I think there's actually no way to, there's no proof of that argument. Like in other words, like you can, it's the perception of the person who's debating because either one could be argued to the end and you'd be right. And I think it's which, which lens you want to walk through life looking and experiencing the world with. And either of them, I'm in embracing of, because either of them still end in the, in the same thing, which is, it is in our interest then to take care of those who come after us. And it should be in our interest as well to take care of those who came before us. You know? And so if that's the self-interest conversation, then alhamdulillah. You know? And if the self-interest conversation is like, well, that's not really self-interest, it's like, well, alhamdulillah. Because you know? <laughs> each way, it's like we give forward and we give back, and so humanity wins. Yeah. Any other questions? That was a good one. That was deep and wide. Um, so, wait, wait, wait. So you got to give people a yeah, moment. Yeah. See, it's like, come on, come on, well, we got a moment. It's interesting because I know with podcasts or like even in television or live broadcasts, it's where it's like, okay, dead time, air time, <laughs> etc. But I deal with like the human brain and the human heart where like, you know, you ask people in an audience a question, they're like, I'm not getting out. And then sometimes it's the awkward silence yeah. that is actually like, okay, 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 maybe I can do this, maybe I can do this. So you actually you can't get people mad. So are there any questions, comments, concerns, aspirations, home dreams, visions, all of the above? See, we got one coming up. Pregnant <laughs> pause. <laughs> so I'm not as uh, I'm not as eloquent as you guys may be in asking my question, but um, specifically on the American Muslim experience, the kind of assertion that I was getting from you and maybe also people like you is that having people understand the diversity and all the different layers and stories that are involved in the American Muslim experience can be more to our benefit than thinking of us as more of a cohesive group. So when you think about any other cultural group, any other religious group, it's kind of fair expectation to think that you can create a, a cohesive vision about them and a cohesive idea of what their story is. And isn't also like a, is a fundamental tenet of storytelling that you will be able to have concrete details about, like, what's the American Muslim story? You have concrete details, you have ideas in your head. And sure, those are reductive, but at the end of the day, they still add something to your understanding about those people. 
So when I get into the conversation with people about the diversity versus cohesion of understanding American Muslims or Muslims in general, is it is it almost like far fetched to think that you deserve to have your own like multiple sets of layers and stories and people and like, people should appreciate and respect that? Because well, I get that you're saying it's got your your assertion is that it has added benefit. I totally get that. But do we have that expectation of other communities ever? I don't really feel that's the case, right? Like it's cool for us to do that to any other cultural or religious community. So I don't know. That's I think that's a great question, and I think part of the interesting thing is to think of yourself is I am those other communities. Okay. Because so what what's what's your ethnic background or backgrounds? You know, for you. Uh, ethnic is Pakistan. Pakistan. Okay, so. In terms of why is your identity Muslim? Yeah. You know, versus it's like, okay, then what is the understanding of the, of the, of the Pakistani community by other communities? You know, and are those two necessarily synonymous with one another? And then as a Chicano, when you're like, okay, other communities, I'm like, well, I'm part of another community. I'm a Chicano community. I'm also French Canadian, you know, and I'm that community. And I'm born here, I'm American, so I'm that community. And I'm also a male, so it's like, oh, I'm part of that community. So it's like, when people say that, I'm like, but I'm those communities, I'm part of the planet, you know. So on one level, my push of that really is trying to encourage and invite people to shatter their current understanding of identity. Is that we need a new identity framework for engaging the broad spectrum of human experience that exists on the planet at this time. Because I often know sitting in a lot of circles when people are talking, let's say, about electoral politics or about nationalism. And they're like, you know what? Well, the Latino community, you know, they, they, they take care of one another and invest in one another and we don't do the same as Muslims. And I, you go in the Latino community, well, the black community, you know, they take care of one another and they, you know, they invest in one another and they don't take it. And you go to the black community, well, the Muslims, they take care of one another, and, but they don't invest in it. And I'm like, everybody is like, you're doing it and we're not. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, maybe then if we actually had an omnibus conversation of like, actually, none of us are taking care of each other. <laughs> we'd actually have a lot better starting point uh -huh. of like, okay, so then who is my community? Is my community those who share a similar language? Is my community those who have a similar birthplace or grandparent birthplace? Is my community those who are going to have a similar burial place? Is my community those who have nothing who look like me but who hang out with me every day and if I'm sick then they come and bring me some food? Like, who is my community and what is that identity? You know, because that's what I'm really interested in is what is an identity? Or how do we create an identity that is not based upon manufactured realities? And manufactured realities is most of the passport stamps that we carry that we say this is who we are. That's right. But you go back 100 years, most of those places do not exist as that stamp. Mm -hmm. The land does, the culture does, the grandparents does, but that understanding of like this is who I am, it's not. So if we can get into honest conversations about what do I fear, what do I dream, what do I love, what are my prayers, what are my hopes, what are my passions, what are my dreams for my children, we'll have a lot better chance, I believe, as sub-communities of this species, of forming places to work together. That's right. To transcend those manufactured realities. That's, yeah. That's a, that's a very good answer. I never actually thought about the idea also that we might have a bias to think that our own community oh. doesn't like take care of itself. That's, that's, <laughs> that's right. Maybe I'm too like invested in my own community. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, part of it is, so I'm 40, you know, and so after 20 plus years of engaged in social good work, you know, whether it's on a grassroots field or a policy field, through listening parties on over 16 countries, is when you do that with I want to understand how you see the world, you realize like, oh wow, like you are frustrated too. <laughs> oh, you, fr you know, and you're like, oh, everything we're saying others are doing for their, you know, their community that we're not doing for ourselves. I'm like, no, actually everyone's saying that, you know, and that's partially the conversation I open up around wealth too, you know, because often we think of the, the, the wealth factor as being the answer to our problems. When you sit with, well, you know, uh, biggie, more money, more problems. <laughs> and you go in the community and you're like, oh, wow, this community itself is actually really unhealthy and it's harming itself. That's right. 
So then what is our purpose and, and who do we want to form friendships with? Cool, thank you. Yeah. I just want to uh, piggyback off what you were saying because, I mean, I think, um, you know, this is something I've talked about in, in my film classes, which is uh, there's a quote by a novelist, Nicholas Meyer, and he said, uh, in specificity you find universality. And I always think about that in terms of sharing narratives with people. I, I think it's really important not to try to make, not to try to make something homogeneous when there is such uniqueness and character and quality that's unique to not just a culture but subcultures within that because those distinctions, those, those added elements that, that create um, qualitative differences, those are, in a paradoxical way, those are the things people relate to in the same way we're talking about how the, the black community looks at the Muslim community, looks at the Hispanic community, et cetera, et cetera. It's, I mean, it's the differences that bring us together, weirdly. I agree. It is the differences that actually, you know, and that's, to me, equality. Dignity and, and basic human respect that is dependent upon equality is often supremacy clothed in the language of sameness. You know, so in order for us to be equal as people, we think, okay, that's because we're all the same. And I'm like, no, we're not. And I shouldn't have to be like you in order to say, like, harm should not happen to me. And I should have a basic access to water and, and human rights and shelter and health care and an ability to walk with my children and, and not be assaulted. That's right. It's like... But you don't pray, it doesn't matter. But you don't speak like it doesn't matter. It's like, what makes you think because someone is different, therefore it is a license to commit harm. Mm -hmm. You know? <clears throat> and that is where the framework of embracing difference comes in. It's like, oh, they're not like it. Yeah, then that's perfectly okay. That's the idea of a human right. Like, it was one of my actually, it was an interesting interjection in an interview Bernie Sanders was doing. I think it was the MSNBC town hall. And he was talking about universal health care being a human right, or being a right. You know, and he says, you know, then the right to health care. And the interviewer interrupts him and is like, hold up, hold up. You know, where does that right come from? And normally within this country specifically, it's like, okay, well, based in the Constitution, etc. And he didn't go anywhere. He just said it, it comes from being a human. Hmm. And like you saw the announcers, like like confusion and then a kind of click go on. It's like, oh, there's other frameworks through which to understand human dignity on this planet. That's right. And I think that's part of the thing. It's like, where do our rights come from? You know, the rights of understanding, you know, is not the creator, you know, a reflection in a beautiful part of the creation, regardless of how it is living. You know, so then where is it for us? Right. You know, in in order to be the pastors of judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we kind of start winding things down, I I'm, I would love if you could share a reading uh, with with the audience, just something brief to give a sense. Yeah, actually, well, when you were saying um, the conversation, it reminded me uh, of something I'd written down a, a ways ago, and um, one one of my favorite. I don't want to say techniques, but one of, one of my favorite things to do, you know, and I had done a series based upon it, was I remember someone saying, you know, we need more Muslim writers. We know, and I'm like, I don't, first off, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, uh, so G. Willow Wilson, you know, and their, her work in, in comics and Marvels, that's not enough for you. And it's like, well, no, 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 we need, we need comic, you forget comic. I'm like, but that's... What I, I like to read graphic novels. That's right. You know, and it's like, I did that to play with the person because they were like, oh, and I was like, oh, do you mean Hafiz? Do you mean Gibran? You know, do you mean all these books I have on my desk that were written hundreds of years ago? There's plenty of writers. You're telling me you don't know about them. That's right. There's a, there's a very different reality, you know, between these two. Yeah. Uh, but part of that is the necessity and the responsibility and the beauty of every generation to go hunt and discover the wisdom and treasures that came before it. And I don't think we do that enough. And that's one of the things that I've been enjoying doing. Mm. You know, it's like, okay, so what is the beauty that's out there? And where is it hidden? And how can I sit with it? And then it's like, okay, now how do I play a key role 
as part of understanding this binary of past future is actually useless and being like all this flows into me so how do I grow up forward and so I'm like okay I want to pick pieces from the past that really resonated with me and then I want to write to that writer as if they were sitting in front of me you know in the styles that I'm comfy with um, and so this is one of them which was actually a conversation uh, <laughs> I wrote to Hafiz um, based upon one of his pieces called Becoming Human. And so Hafiz wrote first in Becoming Human, Once a man came to me and spoke for hours about his great visions of God he felt he was having. He asked me for confirmation, saying, Are these wondrous dreams true? I replied, How many goats do you have? He looked at me surprised. And said, I am speaking of some blind visions and you ask me about goats. And I spoke again saying, yes, brother. How many do you have? Well, Hafiz, I have 62. And how many wives? And he paused, looked surprised, then said, four. How many rose bushes in your garden? How many children? Are your parents still alive? Do you feed birds in winter? And to all he gave me an answer. Then I asked, you asked me if I thought your visions were true. I would say that they were, if they make you become more human, more kind to every creature and plant that you know. Hafiz. Past the paralysis, this world suffocates us at times. Noose ties around necks, sneakers and suits, niqabs and a hoodie, silk fabric we frame ourselves in as if there is a cover for skin from the one who dresses our breath. Do you not remember we were formed in the common, siblings of starlight, children of constellations? London Bridge is falling down and we will all rise up to the one. Who defined freedom? And why would I want to be free from the love of Ya Rab? Layla Khalid told me freedom is both an idea and a principle that even as we pursue cannot contradict the energy within. Cornel West then said, I am a free black man in America, even if in prison my mind will be so. But other parts, not so much. Because freedom has levels. And every week, Usama Cannon reminds us at every level, there's a new devil. <laughs> City Usama, I understand you. I used to chase demons, now they chase me. A tribe with the past they erased hid the breadcrumbs of our road to return. But I have found the map back to my people. It lies in the breath of my Lord, Al-Hadi, Al-Wajid, my Redeemer, resurrect me, I am dead. This world is a humor. I am a joke. And the first time I laughed was three days before I entered the womb. Constellations I danced in. Pure starlight commenting into life. Haley envied me for the relationship I had with my maker. The cosmos are not a location. They are a logic. The universe is a poem. Planets are period. Life is a line break. My God, you are more than the language I seek you in. Hafiz say religion is a theater of freedom. So is the script written or improv? Are we writers or actors? Or we are and we am stages of existence. Dancers of starlight, choreographed universe, the time is a clock called crescent moon, the Sahaba are in the Sahara, witnessing the leaves of Zaytuna and the winds of El Mar, baile con luna is my suna, all there is and ever was is not absent of you, but if you added up the edges of the universe, you would find that humanity's sum is still less than the one. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. And uh, I, I, I'd be remiss, I, we'd be remiss if we didn't point out, uh, we've been talking all about Muslim writers and, and, and that whole thing, uh, if we didn't thank Muslim Writers Collective for hosting us and for giving us and affording us this wonderful opportunity to do our show live. Yeah, and, 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 and for those who 
are only on the podcast. They yes. won't be able to see it. But for those who everyone see, I just realized you for Muslim Writers Collective, it's really interesting because you can actually make an M and then a W and then a C. So you're actually one of the few groups that you're like, oh, we can have our own signs. <laughs> we can throw up MWC wherever we go. <laughs> Well, and, and as we wrap things up, uh, if people want to find you online, I'm, I'm sure you have some, some venues people can find you. Uh, yeah, if you just Google Mark Gonzalez Storyteller, it'll come up because there's different sites for different things and different initiatives. Uh, I also I uh, finished a book last year called In Times of Terror, Wage Beauty, A Personal Guide to Social Good, which was just about conversations over my life and really thinking about uh, what are the reflections I really wish I could offer my family and my loved ones, especially because we live in a country where 75% of people do not have a college degree. Uh, and I find that most of the conversations we have in the books we're writing in, it's like trying to get academic approval. And I'm like, but my dad's never going to read this. And what good is it if I write things that my dad can't benefit from? Um, so finish the book. I've brought them here. Uh, so if you all would like to take a look at them or have conversations about them or have one and you would even like to just you're like, why the heck did you put this down on this page? It's been keeping me awake at night. Uh, would love to chat with you about <laughs> And for people listening, they can purchase it online as well, I imagine. Yes, yeah, so if you go to yep. wagebeauty.com, uh, you'll be able to find it. Um, I'm I mean, we've been utilized. Uh, University of Washington's uh, Master's in Communication is using it for their classes, University of Denver for, uh, for their historical trauma frameworks. City of Stockton adopted it for uh, their summer youth reading list, for youth of color, for their summer programs. So grateful for how the dialogue is being spread you know, in different cities and different places. Great. Wonderful. You, uh, you, you, know, you, you mentioned uh, or you quoted Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah as talking about miracles and the belief in miracles. Um, you know, unbeknownst to us, you mentioned his name, and also unbeknownst to us, you mentioned uh, City Osama Cannon. And I say that because, uh, in, in the sense that our first guest, our first show, was Osama Cannon. So yeah. there's signs everywhere, right? It's just a matter of being able to pick up on those things. So I find that, I found that fascinating. For those who remember, like <laughs> poor '90s one-hit wonders. <laughs> That's a deep cut. It's um, a deep cut. <laughs> Uh, while, while we have you, uh, this is something normally we say on the show, but you all are here, and I know every one of you has a smartphone, and I know you have Facebook on your smartphone, so go to Facebook, type in Diffuse Congruence, find our Facebook page, hit like. I expect all of you to do that right now. Make right. sure you make that happen. No pressure. No pressure at all, but I will glare at you menacing. Yeah. Diffused Congruence on Facebook. It should come right up. Yeah. And if you have any questions or comments, please email us, diffusedcongruence at gmail.com. Uh, we're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher Radio. We, we're on TuneIn Radio. Basically, wherever you get your That's podcast fix, you will find us. So please do uh, hit subscribe, leave us a review, leave us a star rating. Even if you just say, I love it. That's all you need to say. On or I case. hate it. Or, well, don't say that. Just <laughs> keep that to yourself. But if you love it, by all means, share that with the world. And, and we're also on Huffington Post uh, because Ruzaki is a featured writer uh, and his movie reviews go up on Huffington Post. So you can definitely uh, look up uh, Zaki online as well. Zaki is way more uh, active on Twitter. Your Twitter? I'm, I'm on Twitter at Zaki's Corner, Z-A-K-I-S Corner. That's also my website, Zaki'sCorner.com. Movie reviews go up regularly. Uh, I just watched The Huntsman. Avoid that. It's terrible. Uh, that's why I was late, and it was not worth it. So, uh, But on behalf of Pervez Ahmed and our guest, Mark Gonzalez, this has been Diffuse Congruence. Thank you so much. Thank you.